Father God, we come to you this day to worship, to extol you, and to exalt you. Father, uh, we pray for Pastor James as he comes to expound on this word. Father, and we would pray <clears throat> that hearts that do not know you would be open. Father, we pray that ears would be open, that eyes would see. We thank you for your mercies, just as the psalm said, that your steadfast love endures forever, and we thank you for that. Father, we would also pray especially for the Forshea family, Father, for young Beckham, who is under the doctor's care in the hospital. Even now, Father, we pray that you would uh, give doctors wisdom Father, to uh, find out uh, what this infection is, Father, and to uh, give him the proper medication to heal his body. Father, we pray for uh, Erica and Trevor, Father, that you would give them peace in their hearts, Father, if they would look to you and not to uh, be um, fretted or worried in this father in jesus name father we pray lord that his he beckham is in your hand <clears throat> and we would pray for his complete healing in this in jesus name amen thank you blair and good morning to those of you that slipped in here after a little while it's interesting because this week I was talking to Pastor Gerard. If you don't know him, he's my mentor. He's been a pastor for over 50 years, mentoring men for 40 plus years. And I was talking to him because sometimes I can really be the heavy. I'm like, if you're not at Sunday school, what is wrong with you? Or, you know, I start to think, oh, there's no one at Sunday school. And he really encouraged me. And he said, you know what, James, the main time to gather to worship is this service. And, you know, there's some things you don't know at times. You don't know how hard it is to get kids ready on a certain morning or, or whatever that is. So I'm going to try not to be such a heavy. <laughs> I, I, our Sunday school is wonderful, and I encourage you to be there. But it's something that, that God will move on your heart. If God willing, I'm faithful to his word here, it's his spirit that's moving in our hearts to draw us to a closer walk with him. And so I'm going to try not to be the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let God do that. <laughs> um, but it was just good to talk to him. He's another one you want to keep in your prayers. He now has a bout of uh, prostate cancer that he's dealing with. And it's so cool to see someone who's so mature in the Lord that it doesn't even phase him. <laughs> he just knows the Lord is sovereign. And um, he just keeps moving on. So um, that's, that's one word of encouragement I wanted to say because, listen, we're just thankful for what the Lord's doing here. And it's good to have all of you here this morning with us. Um, last week, in, in talking about what we're doing here is we're gathering on the Lord's Day. We're communing one with another. We're um, in relationship one with another, God willing, through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we celebrated, and maybe just a quick word, I'm not going back to Romans probably until after our meeting on June 23rd. Next week, I'll have a special message for the fathers. I know the mothers, I had nothing special for you all, but I've never been a mother. <laughs> I don't know that I have anything to say to you gals. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I am going to have something for the fathers. Um, so uh, just to give you a heads up. But last week we had Communion Sunday, and we talked about communion. And when we celebrated the Lord's table, Paul taught us that the basis for our communion with God and the basis for our communion with one another is his sacrifice, is the Lord's table. 
It's the Lord's table, what it represented, what the Lord Jesus came to do to deliver us out of the power of sin, translate us into the kingdom of God, and to make us sons and daughters to our Father, to make us one, to reconcile us one to another through that sacrifice. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. And what I wanted to, to, to think about here is that's, the, that's the, the fact of the matter, okay? of our relationship with God and with one another. But how does that communion work itself out? How do we actually walk out this relationship one with another? And I was really struck with the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet because he gives us a real object lesson of what our relationships ought to look like. In the world, we see selfishness and hate. In the church, we're supposed to see love and we're supposed to see selflessness. And love is not just a word, but it's worked out. It's something we actually do. And Jesus does it, shows us so wonderfully here. So as we are joined here together, I would submit to you that we are called to live in this world in a way that is countercultural to what the fallen world looks like. Again, it's a way that is only possible, I'll show you as we work through this later, it's only possible for the Christian. Paul exhorted us, and we looked at it last week, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Jesus, as we said last week, he commands us to love like he loves, sacrificially. But how in the world are we to do this? And so Jesus, in this story here, gives us such a practical application of what it really looks like. Jesus demonstrates what selfless love looks like by all he did, of course, to redeem us. But here he is the day before he's going to go to the cross and he washes the disciples' feet. This is, I, I can't tell you the import of what Jesus decided to do there or how important it should be for us to learn what he was trying to teach them. That it's something that it was so important to the Lord that before he would go to the cross, that he washed his disciples' feet for a very real and wonderful purpose. Uh, so as we look through here, uh, I'll be referring back. Keep your Bibles open to John chapter 13, and we're going to look at this together. But I want to see the great servant I want to see the great servant's example, example, and I want to see the servant's mindset. And you see there in verse 12, and maybe, Dustin, we can get the fans going. Maybe, folks, open the windows, let some of the summer in. Let's throw some of that nice, cool air in. <clears throat> but you see there in verse 12, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? And in verses 13 through 17, Jesus is not going to leave anything to, to doubt or to question. He's going to explain to them exactly what it is that he did to them. Because this is something we ought to know and understand because it's ever so important. The great servant. You see there in verse 13, it says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. So after Jesus had washed the feet of the disciples, he asks them this, do you know? And what he says, first and foremost, he says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. You see, they understood who he was. Uh, and he, again, is making it very clearly clear to him there. But in this narrative, we see first and foremost, Jesus points to himself. He he. he, he uh, encourages them again to recognize who he is. This one who had just washed their feet. We have to understand the greatness of who this man was. And listen, they knew it, but Jesus is saying it for a fact. We must know it and understand. See, by now they had realized 
and come to know him as the Messiah. They saw him heal blind eyes, open deaf ears, and raise the dead. They witnessed the feeding of multitudes from just a few loaves of bread and fish. They saw him walk on water and quiet a fierce storm. They knew who he was. They saw the demonstration of who this man was through the power and wonders and miracles in his life. He was no ordinary man. He was God incarnate, the very Son of God. He asked his disciples once, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So you can understand why when Jesus girds himself, grabs a towel, and walks up to Peter and says, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter goes, you're going to wash my feet, Lord? You're going to wash my feet. You see, he understood who Jesus was. He understood the greatness of the man. But this is the very foundation of the story that Jesus is teaching these fellows. That he's so great, yet what does he do? He humbles himself and he washes their feet. He, as John told us at the beginning of this gospel, he, in the beginning, was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is the very one who took upon himself flesh and dwelt among them. Jesus was not just the Son of God incarnate. He was the second person of the Trinity. He was the creator in the, the, the means by which everything was created. It says in Colossians, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in her earth. Visible, invisible, all of it was created by him and for him. Now listen, those boys didn't fully understand who Jesus was yet. Okay? They were not yet filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus many times would say, you don't understand. And even Peter, he said, Peter, let, it, let, let me do this. You don't understand, but I must do this. And if I don't, Pete, <laughs> you have nothing to do with me. You got to love Peter. Then not just my feet, Lord, wash me everywhere. <laughs> Peter was so in that whatever it was, he just loved the Lord. But you have to see, the point of this first part of it is, is that he is the great servant. He is, there is no one greater than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the, he is the great I am, and he makes that sh uh, clear to them. Look at, uh, if you look back to, to John chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, look what, look what uh, John reveals to us here. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God, it's at that point he decides that he'll wash the disciples' feet. After he knew he had overcome, it was a fate complete. The world was his. He was going to be the victor over the enemy, and all of the cosmos, once again, would be under his control. The Father giving it to him, and he's heading back to the Father. But it's this, this very moment that Jesus humbles himself and wants to teach the disciples a very important uh, lesson. What the thing is that we need to recognize first and foremost is if great, Jesus is that great, we need to recognize that we're far less than he is. If Jesus could wash the feet of disciples being who he is, we need to be, have that same mindset. And we'll see that further as we go along. But it's so easy for people in the world, what, what is indicative of man? What marks man? Is it not pride? Is it not, I'm great, right? It's something that, that infects us as Christians. 
And Jesus revealing this to us, who he is, yet doing this very menial task, is trying to tell us this is what ought to mark the life of a Christian. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. We, how are we going to have communion one with another? First and foremost, we need to recognize the example of the great servant and humble ourselves. We need to be knocked down a couple pegs. It's so easy to be puffed up and prideful in and of ourselves. Ought not to be so. And that's why Jesus is demonstrating this to us. Again, everything I'm saying here is going to be the paradoxical way that Christians are called to live in the world. That's what's so wonderful about this. Last week I was pining about how we're in this together, all for one and one for all, but it's really one for all. Christ demonstrated that so beautifully that he delivered us through coming and humbling himself, and that's the way we're supposed to live. That's how we treat each other. First and foremost, we must humble ourselves. This operation of what Jesus did in washing their feet, especially in first century uh, Jerusalem, was the very lowest of the low. It was the most menial work someone could do. It was reserved for slaves. It was reserved for, the Jews would say, for the Gentiles, okay? But D.A. Carson says this, doubtless the disciples would have been happy to wash his feet. They could not conceive of washing one another's feet since this was a task normally reserved, again, like I said, for the lowest, lowliest of menial servants. Peers did not wash one another's feet except very rarely as a mark of great love. I submit to you that we as Christians very rarely wash one another's feet. We as Christians are, are, are too much like the world. We want to be served. We want people to watch out for us. It's all good when someone's there for you, but see, that's not supposed to be our mindset. Our mindset is supposed to be set on others. We're supposed to get our eyes off of ourselves no matter how great we are, <laughs> right? And, and put our eyes on others. But here Jesus reserves normal roles. His act of humility is, in unne is as unnecessary as it is stunning and is simultaneously a display of love, a symbol of saving cleansing, and a model of Christian conduct. Now there's no doubt that, that this, this very much is a picture of what the Son of God has done in humbling himself to deliver us. But in the context of what he's talking about, he's using a very, uh, an object lesson to demonstrate what Christian conduct is supposed to look like, how we're supposed to live in this world. First and foremost, how we treat one another, right? Uh, it just blows me away. Like I'm with Peter. Jesus, you're not, well, I don't even know, even Jesus was there, saying, James, I'm going to wash your feet. <laughs> it would have to be a move of the Holy Spirit for me to allow that, knowing who he was. And it ought to, ought to humble us. The great servant's example, this was the whole point. Jesus was our primary example of how we ought to live. And in particular, during this very humble uh, demonstration, here, Jesus again makes it abundantly clear to them what exactly he was doing and what was, about, what was more than, excuse me, Jesus here now in verse 15 is going to make it very clear about what he's doing and it has a lot more to do than just clean feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. If I then, your Lord and teacher, verse 14, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Too often, I just don't think that's what happens. Too often, the church is at odds with one another. Too often, we're, we're barely communing with one another. 
If we treated each other like Jesus is demonstrating here, we might find that we might grow a little bit closer together. That, that, that when our feet are the dirtiest, one of us comes and humbles ourselves and washes them. And again, this isn't some religious act that we ought to do on Good Thursday where we come and we do it. Let's live it. Let's live that way. This is hard. But think about how important it was that Jesus reserved this moment where he had their attention to do this for them. This is the whole way of the Christian way of life. Christianity is a completely paradoxical and different world and life view in comparison to what the world is doing out there. The world wants to be served. The world wants to be cared for. But Jesus says, no, do unto, your, unto others as I've done to you. The golden rule is, is this, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for in this is the law and prophets fulfilled. This is love, right? Jesus said the first great commandment, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, do unto others as you've had them do unto you, and you'll, you'll, you'll keep God's law. You'll walk in a righteous way that is so different for the, from the world. The world's looking to do unto you before you do unto them. And this is why Jesus said, they'll know you by your love one for another, that we might demonstrate that sort of love. How important is selfless love and service to one another as Christians? How important is selfless love and service to one another as Christians? Where is that on your scale? What does it mean for you to be a Christian today? What best exemplifies the fact that you're a Christian? Is it because we go to a church every Sunday morning? Is it because I know a lot of the Bible? The fact is, if you've truly been changed by the gospel, we'll live and act in this selfless, loving way. We can grow in all that other stuff. But this is, this is really a determiner of the health of your relationship with God, how you treat one another. Uh, Jesus said, how can you love the father who you've not seen if you don't love your brother whom you have seen? Lord, have you seen my brother? <laughs> you might understand. But no, we're called to this type of living. Are we greater or more important than our Lord, teacher, and Savior? If not, I recommend we follow his example. I can only imagine these 12 with sandals and dirty feet in the dusty Middle East and Jesus, the Lord of glory, humbling himself to wash their dirty feet. There's a purpose. That ought to be our way of treating one another. Are we willing to wash one another's feet? I've got this one gnarly toe with something going on with my right big toe. I don't know what it is. I soak my feet to try to fix it up, but it's gnarly. <laughs> I don't know if you look at feet. Feet aren't real pretty. <laughs> feet can be pretty gnarly and nasty. And you get in after, and man, like I'm walking, the dogs are covered with mud, and it's all getting in that weird toe, and, and, and we're just nasty. Our feet are nasty. This is to show us, though, this is the extent to what the Lord is calling us to. There is nothing too gnarly or more nasty than what's going on in our brother or sister's life that we ought not to get our hands right in there, get the water, and let's help clean it up. Let's take care of it. This is the object lesson. This is metaphorically what the Lord wants us to do. There's nothing too difficult, dirty, or distressing that we ought not to be willing to humble ourselves and love one another as Christ has loved us. Again, I submit to you that this is countercultural. I'd much rather be served. Truly. It's okay to admit that. <laughs> this is not going to be easy. 
This is one of those things where Jesus says you must crucify your flesh, or maybe it was Paul, and we're to live a different way. Our natural way is to take care of ourselves and be selfish. But that's not what Jesus calls us to do. He tells us to be selfless and loving. And that just doesn't mean, well, I'm going to pray for you, like James said. Go and be blessed, but we don't help them with what they actually need. This means really being aware of what our brother and sister truly need. And being the ones that, yeah, we're praying but we're the ones that are calling them. What can I do to help? How can I be there for you? We go out to dinner all the time, and I just, it's one of my favorite things. You sit down, and a waitress comes and serves you, or a waiter. Could there be anything better? I don't have to make my food. I don't have to clean up after dinner, right? How would you feel, though, if you jumped in her or his place, and, and they sat down while you fed them? while well, you waited on them, while well, you picked up their nastiness at the table, napkins and, and all types of craziness. I have coffee. There's like six creamers and at least 10 of those little sugars all over the place. I mean, it's easy to be served, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tip them anyway, so that's their job, right? This is our job. This is what the Lord calls us to do and how we are to treat one another and to care for one another. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it, is, not, is it not him who sits at the table? I submit it is. He who sits at the table is greater. But that's not what Jesus said. Yet Jesus said, I'm among you as the one who serves, so we must be too. Jesus at the table. I submit the Last Supper. And what does he do? It's not enough that he's going to have his body and his blood spilt, but he washes their feet. And it should be something that we ought to gravitate to and, 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 and look to do. Uh, one of the, the, the most amazing stories that Jesus talks about in the New Testament was when <laughs> Zebedee's sons, James and John, their mommy, went to Jesus and asked if they could sit on his right and on his left. And all the other disciples were all up in arms because their mother wasn't on the stick. Where was she? <laughs> she should have been talking to the Lord. Can't you do something here? You see, the disciples were just like most of us. They were always talking about who would be the greatest. Who would be the greatest? And Jesus says this in Matthew 20, 25 to 28. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Do you want to be great? Be the first to serve. Do you want to be truly great? Serve. Humble ourselves and serve. We ought to be fighting over one another to see who could be there first. Folks here at Sovereign Grace, may that be our way. Let's strive to be first by fighting over who will be the first to serve one another. Let's gird ourselves with that towel. Let's clean each other's nasty, dirty, stinky feet. And let's be what Jesus calls us to be. The Christian life is not one of standoffishness. It's not one where, you know, we're all nice and dressed up like on a Sunday morning. It's when we're in the thick of it. It's when we're there, hand in hand, helping someone. And it doesn't matter what it is. I don't want to, because listen, most of my Christian life I spent just serving myself. I, honestly, I didn't get it. I, I remember getting saved and going, I want to be the next Billy Graham, right? I mean, I was like all gung-ho about church stuff. But church stuff is meaningless apart from the service. I didn't learn the, the lesson of service until way late in my Christian life. 
I remember going to church and cleaning toilets and going, this is awesome. I'm serving the Lord. I mean, truly. And I'm thinking I got a secret. Like you all get it. You all aren't here and I'm cleaning the toilet. I'm, I'm gaining ground on you, even as we speak. I remember an older gentleman in our church was, was, was getting ill and he wasn't able to take care of himself. And he was falling down and such and I went to help him and his wife. Let me tell you what, it gets pretty serious. Cleaning feet might have been kind of nice. <laughs> but but that's, that's just to say that, you know what, that's what we need to do. What, whatever state we're in, we need to be willing to be there when our brother or sister are at their lowest point, when they're their messiest. It's easy to deal with people that are doing well. It's the people that are struggling where it's difficult. In our Christian homes, I would love to see husbands and wives fighting over who will serve the other best and first. If we get this concept, we'll talk about the men next week. They're supposed to get it. Fathers are supposed to love their wives as themselves. Well, I don't know how much more Jesus, God, Paul could say it, but, but I, I would love to see husbands and wives fighting over how could they serve each other better. And I can tell you, it's okay for dads to do dishes. It's okay to empty the dishwasher. I can't really wash them, but I can load the dishwasher and unload the dishwasher, right? You don't want to eat on plates that I had actually washed. But, but we got to serve one another. We got to care to serve one another. I think about the children. The children, the, the one commandment, honor your father and mother that it might be well with you and you might live long on the earth. You even have a promise. Well, I submit to you as a Christian young man or girl, serve your mom and dad. Not just obediently. How about you do something before they ask? How about that? <laughs> That'd be a pretty cool concept. But see, this is the countercultural way that Jesus is demonstrating that we as Christians ought to live and look like. We ought to look differently. We ought to look different at work. We ought to be those that aren't trying to cut the corners, but are working hard for our bosses unto the Lord. We ought to be those that, 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 that show that sort of love in every area of life, in every sphere of life. Do you want to be first? Then you must be last and servant of all. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Charles Spurgeon says this, In the great Gentile monarchies, princes ruled by authority, force, and pomp, but in his kingdom, the rule would be one of love, and the dignity would be that of service. He who could serve most would be the greatest. The lowliest would be the most honored. The most self-sacrificing would have the most power. Whenever we see the nobles of the earth contending for precedence, we should hear our masters say, but it shall not be so among you. We must forever quit hunting after honor, office, power, and influence. If we aim at greatness at all, it must be by being great in service, becoming the minister or servant of our brethren. Is that your mantra? Is that, is that, is that, whose, whose lifetime verse is that? <laughs> is that your favorite verse? <laughs> you want to be great, it might have to come somewhere up in there. I'm still going to go with God so loved the world, but it's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, Pastor Gerard wrote a new book that came out recently on deacons, which are servants of the highest order, an ancient office for the glory of Christ in his church. He says this, the world screams me first. However, in the church, we live by dying, gain by giving and become great by serving. This is what it ought to be. This is what your life, Christian, ought to look like. Finally, the servant's mindset. I submit to you that this is not an operation that you can read the Bible and just start doing. This is impossible for normal people. 
This is only possible for those that have been changed by the greatest servant. This is only possible for those that know the Lord God. And you see there in verse 17, it says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Knowing is not something that can be done apart from the Holy Spirit infusing, opening our eyes and our hearts and our minds to see what is true. We can't look at this as some sort of a, if I do this, then these things, and I'll be blessed. You will never do these things if you don't know the Son of God. If you don't know in your heart and have been touched by the greatest sacrifice and lover of men. We just cannot know it otherwise. But I submit to you, those who have tasted of the goodness of God, who have been washed by the blood of Jesus, are those who are empowered to know these things, to do these things, and to be blessed. And here Jesus brings up an aphorism. An aphorism is um, a pithy saying or an observation, something that's memorable that you say all the time. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, another one is, is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. The Sermon on the Mount is filled with Jesus' aphorisms. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all else will be added to you. These are things that should stick in your mind that are important observations and sayings. But he says here this aphorism in John 13, 16. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. So again, the servant's mindset set is one uh, resonant within him for those who have trusted in the infinite God. Knowing we're not greater, not only not greater than our master, but we're infinitely less than our master. But knowing that we're infinitely less, yet what he has done for us empowers us. If we have tasted of this great goodness, this mindset now that we will have is only for those that have been transformed by the power of the gospel. It's only those who have been touched by the Lord, only those who have been born again. The best way I can explain it is, I love the way John Stott says it. He says the Christian's life is a cruciform life. That the cross has so changed us, but then it makes us those who are willing to lay our lives down for one another. It's just what Jesus said. I give you a new commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. You can't do that unless the center of your life is the cross unless the center of your life is what the Lord has done for you. It's a mindset that only we get that way. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We will only do them that way. In John 13, 1, Jesus said this, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It's so wonderful. What God has done for us, what the Lord Jesus has done for us, that's what a sinless man can do. <laughs> that's not what sinful folks like you and I can do. But it is something we're called to because of the transforming power of coming into the, the orbit of the Lord Jesus Christ. He loved them to the end. Think about the Lord Jesus. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, we have the relation, that relationship with a risen Lord now. We have this type of intimate relationship with God through the Holy Spirit that indwells us, that so changes us. But think about the love these guys experienced at the hands of the Lord Jesus. Not just all that he had done, but taking the time to show them this amazing object lesson. I don't know if you recognize in that story, he also washes Judas's feet. This is a God, listen, God is wishing that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God is not someone who's just happy he can pour out his wrath. He has to because of his justice, but 
that's what he did in Christ. He made a way for us to be forgiven. He served us. He came to serve us and make himself a ransom for us. So that's what we ought to be for one another. J.A. Carson says this, the foot washing was shocking to Jesus' disciples, but not half as shocking as the notion of a Messiah who would die the hideous and shameful death of crucifixion, the death of the damned. But the two events, the foot washing and the crucifixion, are truly a piece. The revered and exalted Messiah assumes the role of the despised servant for the good of others. He took upon himself the form of a man so that he might deliver us. He humbled himself to that level. If he did that, can we not help each other out? Can we not live? He's loved us so much. It's a shame that we might not live in love. It's a shame that we might not be selflessly committed to one another because of what Christ has done for us. This is our example and this is the mind that we're called to take upon ourselves. In 2 Corinthians, it talks about if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things pass away, all things become new. This is one of the coolest new things that happens to us. We care about others now. We want to help each other. How cool is that? How wonderful is that? That's not anywhere else in God's creation. But it's what God has done for us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer, no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That we should no longer live for ourselves. That's what I'm saying here. That's what Jesus is trying to impart. We don't have to be those that are prideful. We don't have to be those that are selfish anymore. We can be those that care for one another. We can be those that can know and take on this new mindset that's exactly what Paul says in Philippians 2, 5, and 8. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, isn't that exactly where he says, if I, your Lord and Savior, being in the form of God, the creator of heaven and earth, would humble himself, who did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. If he did that, can we cast off reputation? Can we cast off a deep care for who we are? Can we recognize that it doesn't matter who you are? You're, you're nothing. We're nothing but sinners saved by grace. How we ought we not to treat each other so much better? Why are we not stumbling over each other to go help each other out at times? I, I can't. Yankees are on tonight. I can tell you, people call me at different times. I go, Oy, oh, I got a lot of self-pampering I had planned. <laughs> you know? But listen, let's be challenged. If we're joined together by that communion table, let's be joined together by the life, death, and service of our Lord Jesus Christ to one another. Let us cast off our own reputation, recognizing that the only thing that matters is who we are in Christ. The world screams me first, but we ought to live by dying, gain by giving, and become great by serving Isaac Watts says, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain, richest gain I count but lost, and pour contempt on all my pride. May we be those that are humble, that are emptied of who we are. I think if we can just be caught up with who Christ is, what he's done, 
and really live according to who we are. See, the problem is we live the old life, not realizing we've been changed. We've been made new. And in being changed and being made new, we're made to be servants of one another, to wash each other's gnarly big toes. It's important. So let's come up. In conclusion, um, I want to just read this that Jesus says to his disciples. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Folks, then he says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. These are the works of Christians. It's selflessly serving one another in love, like our Lord has done for us. Okay. Um. Oh, you guys took a hymnal from me. Where's that hymnal? Come on up here, Blair, with your hymnal. Come on up, uh, musicians. Please turn to page 318 for our final song. Hmm? Yes, but I want to read verse 3 as we close. 318, and it will be up on the slides. Holy Spirit, from creation's birth, giving life to all that God has made, Show your power once again on earth. Cause your church to hunger for your ways. Let the fragrance of our prayers arise. Let us on the road of, lead us on the road of sacrifice, that in unity the face of Christ will be clear for all the world to see. As we, as we sing this, let this be a prayer.